Look, before we get started, um, I'm not going to get to everything. Pretty normal, right? Anybody need to make a cup of tea before we dig in? There's a PDF that will be online by mid-morning tomorrow that will include everything I say here today. Some of it will be notes, and you may email me and say, that one statement in your notes, I don't understand. I don't remember what it was. Can you unpack it? I'll be glad to do that. But there's also a section in the notes that's at the end that will be everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask kind of stuff. Like, what's with incense? What's with bells? What's with crossing yourself? What's all that about? Because there just isn't time. Because the main questions that we need to look at today are much bigger than what does our service look like, but what is the church, and what have God's people done when they gathered to worship, and what's the deal even with gathering to worship as God's people. So we are going to dig into this whole theater, this image, this acting out of being a sacramental people when we do come together. In that very first week, we looked at that compass rose, the Anglican compass rose, with those elements and in, in things that are held in a balance and attention, leaning towards the center to love and follow Jesus. And in the second week, we looked at being a sacramental people in all of our lives and everything we're doing, being word and sign to the world. And last week, that beautiful balance that we have as Anglicans that we're not led by this strict line all the way from Rome, but yet, while we do have the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is that first amongst the primates, each of the provinces lead themselves, and there is a communion and relationship, not in legislation, together globally. The same way there's a communion of dioceses within a province, the same way there's a communion of parishes within a diocese, in the same way that inside of a parish there's a communion of congregations and very different people. And this is actually one of the very things that makes us a beautiful church. Today we're going to look at what it is when we come to worship. The first thing that we need to grab a hold of, though, is that no matter what church... What flavor of church? If it's an Orthodox Christian church, there's always three forming things of what is the church, and you can always see it in their mantra, their motto, their vision statement. They all come down to up, out, in. Real simple. Every church does that. Even in our new tagline with the new logo. A joyful community connecting with God and people. A joyful community connecting with God and people. You can't get away from it because that's what Scripture tells us the church is supposed to be. Now, this people that we are known as the church, the people of God, we're first known as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, as ambassadors, aliens, strangers, a holy priesthood, a nation of believers together. And there's something when the church is together that doesn't get fully seen when it's scattered. When you love your neighbor and offer the food, the help, the cup, people can taste and see that God is good. This is true. But they're not seeing the whole body. The only time they see the body brought together is when we gather to worship. And there becomes this confusion of, is the place, this piece of this block, this building, this room, which is the church? Or is it this people? In the staff meeting this week, in our team time, one of the first things having this conversation was, well, what do we call this room? Because we've got Warren Hall and Robertson Hall and the chapel and Jeff Toy Room and all these places with names. The Olive Branch, Thompson House, etc., Sanctuary, we kind of got that. But what do you call this room? Well, we call it the church. And is that right or is that wrong? In true Anglican fashion, yes. The Greek word often referred to in the New Testament is ekklesia. Literally, the called out ones. The assembly of God's people. It's a both and. That You're not the church, but we're the church, and we're the church wherever we are, and we're these called out ones, but we're also these people who come together and assemble. 
The word that we actually get church from is another Greek word called kriakon. Really fancy Greek word for the Lord's house. So when you say church, it is a people, and it actually literally comes from a word meaning the Lord's house. It's both and. See, all the way back to the first century, they were Anglicans. I think one of the key things is that as Anglicans, we are formed by Scripture. And we need to see that when the church is together, it practices these signs. That we are a sacramental people, but when we come together, there's something that happens that doesn't happen. They All of that is a holistic piece. Doesn't happen as a life group, or as an individual, or as a ministry, or as a mission organization. It's the church, when it comes together, that the whole piece of that sacramental expression. This is the rehearsal of the other six and three quarter days of our life. We rehearse this. We practice this. We proclaim and profess this to the world when we come together and are the church all together. Now, I'm going to run through several scriptures The whole point of these scriptures is you will see that from the beginning of God's people, God's people have always come together, joined together, small or large, and worshipped God together. And there's certain things they did when they came together and worshipped. I love it because they, starting at verse 8, there, 8-8, is... They read the book of the law, making it clear. So there was teaching about the meaning. And then they read this to them for all the people, and there was this repenting, this confession and forgiveness. And then down here in the very next chapter, all right, this is my defense. You know how there's a a thin line between a sermon and a hostage situation? And I offered you to go make a cup of tea? I'm actually pretty good. I want you to see this. They stood, they stood, not sat, where they were, and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day, six hours. They stood before they were taught, before they responded, before they prayed, just the word for six hours. Do you remember Paul preached so long that a guy fell asleep and fell out the window and died and he had to go raising from the dead? I haven't killed anybody yet. When you come forward to um, the New Testament, the Gospel of St. Matthew, the very end there, go and make disciples teaching them. Jesus returned to Galilee, and he went to the synagogues, and he, as he went through the region, he taught in their synagogues. And then he came to Nazareth, never welcome where you grew up. I could never go back to the church where I first came to true understanding and faith and be received. I've preached there one time. I was instantly challenged because they all knew me. Right? I was so glad to get away. The Acts of the Apostles. And from the very thing, they gathered together in the temples and in their homes, and they broke bread, they remembered, they did teaching, they prayed. The second part, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He found, they met with the church and taught great numbers of people. In Colossae, get together so as you teach and admonish one another, gathering together as the church. First Corinthians, they got together and together they practiced communion. And in 14, what shall we say? We do it all for the glory of God. Now this is an interesting one because in that chapter, they're talking about all those supernatural signs that showed up. But he ends it by saying, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And in all the congregations of the Lord's people, that there's some kind of order and boundaries when people come together and worship. And then there to Timothy, his young evangelist, church planting pastor. He says, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching In the good old Hebrews, let us consider how we spur one another on, not giving up meeting together. Somehow through time, God's people have always met together to be unified and have direction. Now, there's some 
things that we practice that are sign, but there's also encouragement that comes to us. And from the beginning of time, I, I do want to tell you this. And I bet in this service there's, there's a number of people who often, if not a couple people, who always feel this way. This is where people give up on gathering together. They'll just go be a Christian by themselves. You've heard the analogy, the barbecue pit where one coal is placed off by itself and it loses its heat and goes cold. But when they're together, that fire spurs one another. But I know good and well. I've never been there myself. I'm often there and I lead the services where there's a deflating experience of the worship service. It just didn't do it for us that day. How many of you confess you've ever been there? Yeah, right? Yeah. Can I get an amen? I found this quote by a friend of mine. In worship, we often fail to remember that God is the primary audience and the one that matters. We're not to design worship to please a crowd. We're to engage in worship in order to please God. The purpose of gathered worship does encourage the body, form it and reform it. But our worship is to God first and over everything else. That does not mean it's not winsome, but it's not the driving factor of the what and maybe even the how. Is that those things take place, but we do remember that when we come together, we're centered on God and not ourselves. Our very opening words in the gathering point us in that direction. But through the Old Testament and the New Testament, a list of things take place. And if we went back, if you took, look, I I could have given you dozens upon dozens upon dozens of verses. The ones that I read, while it may have seemed a little bit banging on the pan a little bit long, they're a tiny reflection. But through the Old Testament and the New Testament, when God's people came together, those are the things they did. They acknowledged God. They prayed. That prayer had a lot of, a lot of shape and looked like a, dof- a lot of things. And I want you to capture this. The gift of confession and forgiveness. No other attempt of human beings to try to figure out who a God is except for us includes the gift of confession and forgiveness and leaving clean. That's a beautiful part, and it's through Old and New Testament. Through the Old and the New Testament, they hear God's word and they interact with God's word. There's always some type of profession of faith, and that comes in many forms. And they engage God personally. The Old Testament Passover, the Old Testament um, offering of sacrifice at the temple, the flip side for which that was a shadow of the completed sacrifice of Eucharist and communion and remembering Jesus. Our friends on the Protestant side, our friends right down the street or at Cornerstone or at Arise or the Presbyterians. Presbyterians are a little better. We'll give them a little grace. But look, my first ordination was as a Baptist. There's your, your general service. It's a sandwich. We used to call it the the sandwich. An upset of worship, the word, because that's the center of everything, and then an intimate responding set of worship. It's not wrong. It just leaves out some of these parts that are demonstrated through the Old and the New Testament. That is a beautiful part we have retained. Occasionally, they will do communion, but not often. And even more rare is the act of confession, but there's no affirmation, proclamation of forgiveness for the human soul. Now, there's something beautiful. I spoke with this fellow, a Catholic fellow who had become an Anglican. And he said something, and I was like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Hold your thought. I need to write this down. And he said this, I am an Anglican Because a friend invited me to church. I am because of six centuries of music that is so beautiful, it brings tears to my eyes. I am because we are a body of believers who can say we are truly sorry 
and humbly report. I am because we are all welcome at the table of the feast that fills my heart. This is where God sent me, blessed me, and exactly what I needed. Now, if our Roman sisters and brothers came in and sat in our service, they would recognize the flow. They would recognize those patterns. They would recognize the words which are oh so similar. But quite often they have shared with me, your Eucharist is more beautiful than ours. And I said, I find that fascinating. Why do you say that? And they said, the people are more involved. There's things, it's not just the priest or maybe the priest and one other person, but there's multiple people involved in the service, in the proclamation of things that happen in that worship and in that service. Now, here, the vital parts of ours, because we have morning prayer and evening prayer and noon prayer and compline night prayer, we always have this gathering greeting. We always have the word and a response to it. And we always send the people. Those are the three elements that you send in any kind of service. And regularly, when we do Eucharist, there's these other parts. Now, the most recognized is our normal Eucharist service. That's our normal Sunday gathering. In this thing, there's three things I want you to see that make up the Anglican Eucharist. It would be the same in the Roman church. We gather, we engage the word, we practice sacrament, and then we send people. Those three main elements, though, are the key parts. If you look in any of our prayer books from England to New Zealand, the U.S., Canada, Australia, Kenya, they all have three movements. Think of it as a symphony. The first movement of the symphony is the gathering of the people. The second part of the symphony is receiving God's word and responding back to God's word. The third part of the symphony is the sacrament that's offered. Did you notice that offertory is part of the sacrament? Part of the command of God to worship God? That it's actually not part of responding? If I had taken a test before I had learned all of that, I would have put offertory as part of the response. But it's actually part of the sacrament, part of the, the, the connection with God, part of obeying God to participate in that. And final, the, the mass, the sending, the dismissal of sending the church back out. That all of those pieces form that six and three quarter days that remind us and form us and teach us and train us who we are to be as God's people. Now I want to unpack the Eucharist itself. The first thing that happens is this Eucharist prayer. Now, we call Eucharist for all of the prayer and communion. But Eucharist is the great thanksgiving. It's actually that prayer that the priest does at the very beginning in which the body participates and responds with. In that profession, we this is basically what we're doing. We acknowledge that God is and that God created and that we're part of that. And that we fell, and that it was God's idea to redeem us, and that God redeemed us through Jesus, and only through Jesus, the one unique contribution that is so different, and that that is our hope, and we proclaim that God is good. Part of that proclamation is the Sanctus, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. And then the Benedictus, the blessing. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And often you will see people, and I practice this, not as some hocus pocus, but when they reach that benedictus, they will cross themselves. There's nothing magical about that. It is what you're saying with your mouth, you're acting out with your action. And and when I do it, I'm saying, yeah, I want some of that. I want your blessing, Lord. I want to be one of yours that's marked by what I'm participating in. And then comes the epiclesis. It may look different depending on the church. When Eric Etwell celebrates and presides over communion, he puts his hand here, and when he lifts the cup, he does a little cross. Some people do the epiclesis, and then they cross, I cross, and then do my hands. Why? Because I'm weird and want to be different. No, it's just the way I was trained, and you do what you were trained. In doing this, 
It's called an epiclesis. It's a very fancy Greek word for the calling down. We're asking God to engage with us. And that's an important part. And I'll get to that in a second. And um, then comes the invitation for everybody to participate. When we do that epiclesis, there's basically three positions. Now, being Anglicans, there's probably 47 other variants of that. But there's three main positions. The first side, the reformed part. We are remembering what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, and it stops there. It's a memory, and it's an obedience to act into it and participate in it. And that's okay. My challenge is, are, is our faith merely just a collection of facts that we say? Is our worship merely just mental? On the other side, Like our Roman sisters and brothers, there's Anglicans who hold that transubstantiation. The Roman church, which is what they're holding on to, has this place where that bread and that wine, while it remains bread and wine, it becomes the very body and blood of Christ. And it's not re-crucifying Jesus over and over again, quite often what our Reformed brothers want to say. It's more of the timeless, I am entering into participating and marking myself as needing the body and blood of Christ and that I can't save myself. I'm coming to this table humbly. The Roman church gets this mainly, multiple passages, but mainly John 6. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood. My challenge here is it it offers a lot of space for some confusion and that if you don't have it, you don't get saved. I kind of wrestle with that danger of that. Being the via media, the middle way, I sit in the middle. This is Anglican, this is Anglican, and this is Anglican, where it's more than just remembering we are engaging with God in a very present, real way, because God wants relationship with us. He doesn't want us to pass a test on having the facts straight. But we don't know enough, and it's mysterious, and I'm okay leaving it in that mystery box. That's the beauty of our church, is that we can be comfortable with this full breath. In our church, there will be people in all three of these places, and that we can still come to this table together. In our liturgy of the Eucharist, we say, with all the company of heaven and all, with all the company of heaven and all the hosts. The hosts being the angelic um, beings worshiping God and the company of all of the church. Have you ever noticed that all of the oldest churches, the graveyard is right there literally around the church? St. Peter's is that way. When it opens, it was going to be Christmas, COVID, it'll probably be Easter. When it opens, you can't walk to the door without going past the graves. In history, when the church and people did not move as much, you walk past your mom's grave every time you went, and your grandparents, and your great uncles, and your dad's best mate, and your mom's Sister, you walked past them, and so when they would practice communion and the words are said, we join with all the company of heaven. There's this timelessness that we are placing ourselves in a place, not in some hocus pocus, that just like people have always done, worshiping together, the very people that we know and love, we're continuing that and bearing witness to the sacrament in the world. The church actually does have people interred out here in the Garden of Remembrance. For some of them, it's a plaque, but there are ashes right here on the ground. And I don't say those words without thinking of those people who were right here on this ground and practiced this worship right here in this building. And then we finish it and we all join into it. And then we have a prayer afterwards. We do the Lord's Prayer In our forms of worship, the Lord's Prayer can be done multiple places. We tend to do it in this church at the conclusion of communion. And then there's a blessing, and then there's the sending. Now, I want to hit that communion 
see what's next. I can't remember. Right. I want to hit that communion. Communion in the Old Testament was Passover. They ate a meal together. You're not going to tell me you had a bunch of Jews in the room and there wasn't a bunch of talking going on. Not going to happen. I had Jewish godparents. Meals were, wouldn't have missed them for the world. It was comedy. And then there was the early church in communion where they had full meals, these love feasts. Paul had to write to Corinthians to kind of straighten out when they weren't doing it very well. Their church was growing in a varying group of different kinds of people, and they weren't loving each other in unity and deference like they should. So he had to address it. But over time, as churches got bigger, having a whole meal every time they came together got more difficult. And it got institutionalized. And it became sacramental sign and less of the participating. In the first half of the 20th century, those people loved having church and having a cup of tea afterwards. But it was a cup of tea afterwards to catch up with a friend. Somewhere in the past 20 to 30 years, though, we've begun to recapture and reimagine that that morning tea isn't just a cup of tea. That, yes, we've done the sacramental sign. Yes, we've had that bread and the wine. But it actually, until we share and have meal together, we actually haven't practiced all of what communion is. So you often hear me say, or the worship leaders say as we um, end and conclude... Join us next door for a cup of tea, something to eat, as we continue our communion. That's not just words to get people to hang around so that they have good relationship. It is actually part of our worship. When you look at all of these parts that make up our worship, they are the things that remind us that this is who we are and how we're supposed to live. Now, there's other parts of the gathered people. There was a time when weddings would be done at the end of the service. Hopefully they would present themselves to the priest before the service began. But at the end of the service, it would be, okay, look, like when we do the chocolates, it would be, hey, so-and-so and so-and-so are going to get married today. And they would come forward. They would get up and come forward. Hence the root of that saying, is there anybody here who knows any reason why they shouldn't get married? Because you lived in the same place your whole life. Everybody knew you. And the priest just wants to make sure before they do this and Later find out there's a problem, just making sure everything's good, and they would do the service. But we do baptisms and confirmations in our services still, and they used to do ordinations, setting someone apart in a service, but now we tend to do that separately. We have buildings, but they're not absolutely required to be a people. There are Anglican congregations in Africa who will meet under a tree today. There are Anglican believers, there are Christian believers, even in North Korea, who will secretly meet and unroll the little piece of paper that is the only bit of scripture they have. And they will break some stale, dried, probably moldy bread, and they will participate in communion. We have lots of liturgy options. We used to have the Book of Common Prayer, and this is what thou shalt do, and thou shalt do this, and this is it. But now today... All across the world, most of the provinces have multiple liturgies, and they focus different ways. When we go to 4, 5, 6, 4, 7, 6, there's a certain celebration. One of them celebrates creation. Very Kiwi that we would have that. But we also can take and pull pieces from other provinces, particularly when it gets to prayers. We can pull these things and use this creativity to bring them in and celebrate them. When you look at Even back in the Church of England, they now have multiple forms and even more formalized and more casual forms of the liturgies, but they all follow those same parts. The things that we call sacred now were somebody being creative, somebody looking for some kind of sacramental sign of how can we act out. In this church, That cross that sits in Robertson Hall has been brought in here and people put post-it notes of prayers or confessions onto that cross. Serving in the uh, Wellington Cathedral there, very huge, long, deep, traditional formed cathedral. We had this big cross Easter a couple of years ago and we, we weren't sure, being a cathedral, how many people would come forward. 
Several hundred people moved up into the chancel from the steps, which would be here, into the chancel where the choir is, all the way up to the sanctuary, crowded in, and everybody participated in kneeling down. There were a lot of older people I didn't think would, but they wanted to. And they went and they nailed their confession to that cross. Something powerful in using that creativity, the sound, the imagery, the taking on Jesus' sacrifice for us. But we need to celebrate and look for ways to be creative. Creative in teaching, creative in prayers, creative in our worship and our response to God. I've seen people use water and rocks and writing and candles and silence in multiple prayer forms and stations and poetry and spoken word and drama and video and art. We're a Celtic tradition. Creativity in art and beauty to say more than mere words can say has been part of us from the beginning of time. Why do we do all this liturgy that we do? It's real simple. Now, Cranmer was a genius in giving us this. It also got him killed a year later for doing this. But you had these English people in an English civil war, Catholic and Reformed, fighting each other. Not as bad as the continent, but still pretty bad. You go to Oxford and there's Martyrs Square, where the three main leaders who helped form our church came from. He knew that the Old Testament people had these gathered times to form and teach and encourage and send the people to be the people of God to the world. But as the church moved from the Jewish synagogue into the Greek world and the Latin world, into the upper western part of the continent of Europe, all the way to Britannia, you had these pagans who were coming to faith, who had vastly different world views of what it was to be human and what it was to interact with God. From the very first century, all of Paul's epistles are written to deal with problems of people losing the plot within a couple of decades of Jesus, and they were trying to hold them back. Yes, we have it in the creeds, but Cranmer knew that the order and form of our worship was a way of forming, categorizing, teaching the people about what is truth. Almost all of our liturgy is direct quote or summation of Scripture in what it says. When we do the peace, there's two sayings, a bid in response by the worship leader that says, what do they say? Remember? What are the words that are said? The peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Word of Christ dwell in us richly. Direct quote of Scripture straight out of Colossians 3. And it's through our entire worship that Cramner kept that, that the order and liturgy, that practice, that habit of taking us through all these elements that we need to remember that has been present as God's people from Old Testament to today that will keep us from generation to generation. Because every generation tends to float off this direction or that direction. We're floating 180 degrees apart from the issues of 20 years ago. That that liturgy, that that constant use of Scripture is our keel and our rudder to keep us faithful and true. Because we tend to do, just like the Old Testament, do what's wise in our own eyes. Now, when he came to, Cramner came to the Epiclesis, that calling down and the invitation, he needed to weave these people together. And it's beautiful. And I think it's equally appropriate today as ever. He wrote these words, look for and listen to the Reformed and the Catholic woven together to be healthy and holistic. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine, which we receive, may be to us the body and blood of Christ. And that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. And there in the 1500s, the Catholics went, I can sign up to that. And the Reformed went, yeah, I can go along with that. And then with the final invitation to communion. Draw near and receive the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ in remembrance that he died for us. 
let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Cramner understood this balance of sacramental sign and reformed truth in how we worship. Now look, there's low and high. We're not too high up the candle. If you went to St. Michael's, they're so high, they almost burn their tush on the flame. If you went to St. Timothy's, they're so low, they're barely on the stand. That's okay. You will still recognize the forms in the order in the worship. What gets dangerous is when we chunk stuff out because we don't understand. Part of that is we as a church don't do a good job of helping people connect and recognize these little reminders. I've talked about the morning tea, didn't I? Yeah, I just didn't do that in the last service, just making sure. Okay. I talked about a lot. Remember that that PDF will be available on in the sermon part of the website. And you will be able to go and pull that down. And all the things that I didn't get to talk about, the incense and the bells and what that's about and how that's used, will be in there. I'll tempt you with one story. As a kid in New Orleans, very French, very Catholic, any time you pass the church, you still see them do it today, although not quite as demonstratively. As a kid, it didn't matter if you were Jewish. You went past the church, you genuflexed, you kneeled. Now you go, why do they need to kneel? That's so religious. Until you get to Romans 10 and it says every kneel will bow. But you would never go past the church. One of the mamas would grab you by the ear and pull you back and... You would genuflex and you would cross yourself three times. Probably a little severe. But when we were in New Orleans a year ago, 2019, there we are. I'm walking past a French church. I'm going to see him. He's the the pastor of that parish. He's a Catholic priest. And somebody's driving by and it turns red. And they look up and they see the church and they cross themselves. (laughs) They probably don't even realize why. And what they're doing. But there's something, that sincerity, that reminder, that placing, that habit that calls us to who we are. So I offer those things to you to look at. Now next week we're going to look at something you may have never even heard of. The 39 articles. The foundation of doctrine. And it kind of is the, as they worked out, what are the things that we actually hold to? But being truly Anglican until we don't. We'll talk about what is our doctrine and what is it we hold to. And then the last week will be Anglicans on mission. So thanks for enduring me um, on this. And I hope that you found it not just informative but encouraging. And some of the meaning and purpose behind it can start to come alive for you as we act out the theater of our worship to be signs to and with one another for and to God and as a sign to the world on the outside. Amen.